Okay, so in physics and in science sort of in general, we tend to look for order. And what I'm going to tell you about is in equilibrium for structures and also for dynamic systems, um, there's a way to find order even if you don't know what the order is. And sort of to illustrate the basic idea here, we can look at Pollock and Mondrian, and it's clear to everyone that which one is more ordered. Well, it's clear that the Mondrian is more ordered, I hope. Okay? The question is, can we quantify it? How would you quantify it? Okay? And as in everything nowadays, you expect the answer is probably on your cell phone or your computer. Okay? But it's not on Google. It's in your camera. Okay? Because the camera stores these images in a compressed form, and if you're lucky, and you pay enough money for your phone or your camera, it losslessly compresses it, which means you can get all of the information from before the compression back by decompressing it. And when you do this, you find, aside from overhead, so these are three images all the same size. One's the Mondrian, one's the Pollock, one's just white. There's overhead in the compression, which corresponds to about 9,000 bytes here. And if you just look what it does with the Mondrian, it's only 12,000, subtracting the overhead is 3,000, subtracting the overhead from the Pollock, it's a megabyte. So you can tell from that directly, quantitatively, that the Mondrian is more ordered than the Pollock. Okay? Um, quantitatively, a factor of almost 300. Now, the basic idea here that I want to get across is that the more organized, ordered something is, the less information you need to describe it. That's the essence of the idea. And the question now is how you find out how much information there is. And there are several ways of doing it. The original way, the start of inf information theory, was Shannon's work on Shannon entropy. Shannon entropy is the same as thermodynamic Gibbs entropy. Okay, it's just the probability for an occurrence the log times the log of the probability. Um, and uh, that's a probabilistic combinatorial way. That's the way we learned it in statistical mechanics. But Kolmogorov, same Kolmogorov that gave us the, the turbulent cascade, same Kolmogorov that made sure that the Russians are much better in math than we are because he wrote the textbooks for, un for high schools and public schools in mathematics. He came up, he's a very original guy, came up with another way. He said, okay, you can do it probabilistically or combinatorially, but you can also do it algorithmically. And so what he said is you, get an, uh, you can measure the information in the system by the minimum length of a computer code which will generate that data set. Okay? Um, we'll look more at this later, but that's a great idea. It really allows you to think about problems a lot, uh, clearly. Um, the next thing you can do is you can look at lossless compression. So lossless data compression is a way of trying to approximate what the Kolmogorov complexity is. It's trying to reduce the information to the smallest data file you can from which you get the complete information back. So, if compression, if compression algorithms are great, then what you get from the length of a compressed file from the data set, okay, is the entropy, essentially. And why might this work? The reason it might work, if these things are great, is because everything you do nowadays Communication, computing, stock trades, cell phones, streaming video, data storage, everything depends on data compression. And the people in information theory and computer science know that, and they know what the limit is. The limit is the Shannon entropy, so they do the best they can. And this is worth something like, information is worth like 4.8% of the GDP of the world. And there are other things, there's finance and other things that depend on it. It's worth about three and a half trillion dollars a year, okay? And that's why you might hope, okay, and that's what we're experimentally going to test, okay, that the compression algorithms are really good and hence give you a measure of the information and the entropy. Okay, the people who are really involved, really responsible for 
this work. All the work is really done by Stefano, uh, who's a postdoc who works with Dov Levine, who's the Technion, and me at NYU, Stefano's at NYU. He actually is out in Illinois today. He got a job offer from University of Illinois, and he's really worried because he was raised in Italy and in London and in Cambridge, and he's worried he's going to be stuck in Urbana the rest of his life. <laughs> anyway, and Dove over here is the guy, you guys may or may not know, who invented quasi-crystals with Paul Steinhardt. Okay, so from what I've told you now, you sort of may get, maybe get the idea that I'm going to do something rough, not quantitative, I'm going to wave my hands a lot and stuff like that. And it's not true. What I want to show you is you can really do quantitative things with the data compression. And so the easiest thing to do is just show you an example. This is a dynamic model. It's a conserved lattice gas. What you do, it's in one dimension here. You can do it in n dimensions, but here's a one-dimensional version. Uh, you have sites which are occupied or unoccupied, only unoccupied or occupied, never doubly occupied. You can throw particles down randomly on this. Okay, and the rule is if you have a nearest neighbor, then these sites with nearest neighbors are active. And what you do to the active sites is in the next step, you empty them to neighboring, you empty those sites to neighboring empty sites. And this gives you a dynamics, okay, and the system evolves with time until either it comes to a steady state where everything is still moving around because it can't find a configuration where you have no nearest neighbors, or it finds an absorbing state, okay? And then it stops evolving. So when you throw the particles down, okay, you can write down, in this case it's very easy, just zeros and ones, a data string here, and you can compress it. And as a function of the coverage of the density here, from zero to one, okay, you can look at what we call the com computable information density, CID. It's simply the size of the compressed data file over the size of the raw data file, okay? And when you do that, you get this curve, which actually is just the entropy of mixing for a system like that. Turns out it does that pretty well. What was more interesting is when you let the system evolve with time, it does this. Okay, and it gives you something which has a cusp here at a half, okay? Now, if this were the entropy, that would indicate that you have a second-order phase transition here, okay? Um, so that's one thing you can do with this, but you can answer other questions as well, and the questions you might ask about active systems, about dynamic systems, not in thermodynamic equilibrium, is whether you can tell something about the ergoticity of the system, how many states are sampled, whether it goes ergodic, whether they're sampled evenly and such, and things like that. We can do that with this. What we can do, for example, is if I just take the curve that I just showed you here, okay, the final curve, this is after 10 to the seventh steps, okay, um, these were absorbing states. Okay, on this side, less than one half. Greater than one half, these are all active states. That's obvious because at greater than one half for the simple problem in one dimension, if I have greater than a half, I can never find something where I don't have a nearest neighbor occupied. Okay. So these are the absorbing states. I can also ask, given the rule here, that absorbing states are states where I have no nearest neighbors, I can ask, what are the, how many, how many states do I have where there are no nearest neighbors? I can actually calculate that, or I can simulate it. I can just M Monte Carlo throw down particles and find all configurations with no neighbors, and compare that with what you get for the absorbing states from these dynamics. And you see that it's lower here. The absorbing states that are found by this, these dynamics are lower than all the absorbing states that there are. And from the idea that I'm trying to get across to you, that implies that these are more ordered. And we don't know what the order is, or we didn't know what the order is when we started. Once you know that these states are more ordered than these states, you can look at the states and see what goes on. 
In fact, what you can simply do is the two-point correlation function, the density-density correlation function. And what you find is for you pick a particular density over here, you compare the correlation length, which is given by the decay of this correlation function, for all of the states and for the absorbing states, and you find there's a characteristic length scale over here where they're correlated, and in the absorbing states, here it's less than 100, here it's about 100 times bigger. So here, once you know to look for order, you can go and look for it and you can find it, and you can find that it's simply in a, cor a correlation length for this alternate lattice, alternating sites. The reason it's more correlated, it turns out, is the da dynamics here spreads things out. When these guys, it starts, let's say, in this dense region and spreads out from there. Okay? And that's why it's more correlated. Um, so you get something from this. You find order where you didn't know it was before. What else can you do with it? Well, another thing you can do with it, you can look at the time evolution of the CID, of the information here. And what you find is, if you start at low density, okay, it takes a short amount of time to find a absor an absorbing state. Okay? The higher the density is, the longer it takes to find that. You can plot the time that it takes to find an absorbing state as a function of density, and you find this critical slowing down, just like in a second-order phase transition. And even just from looking, from fitting the CID as if it were an order parameter for the system, you can even pull out the critical exponents. Okay? You can also ask about ergoticity in the system on the active side. This is the active side. Here we're showing on the active side all of the active states you can have that are allowed by the dynamics and what you find, okay, and they're right on top of one another, so all of the active states here are completely ergodic. And then you look, after doing all of this, just by compression, you look at what's been done before, and what's been done before is for this active system, the order parameter is the activity itself, and in the absorbing states here, the activity is zero, and here the activity turns on, okay? And it's exactly at the point you find from doing the compression and just the compression. Okay, so hopefully I've shown you that we're not just fooling around. We can actually do things with this, okay? I should mention that there's another group, Roy Beck's group in Tel Aviv, which came up with the same idea at about the same time, but they're using it to get the entropy for protein folding. Okay, information order and entropy. Okay, so Shannon started the field. Here's the Shannon entropy. It's, um, it's uh, combinatorial or, or from probabilities. Uh, the problem with this, you say, you might say, why don't we just do this? So what you have to do to do the Shannon entropy is you divide, you decide on a certain block size, okay, and you go and see the different configurations that are in that block size, okay, in your system. If you choose a block that's only 20 long, most systems that you have won't sample, you don't have enough information to sample all the states that would f you find in that block. So it's very hard to calculate that from any experiment or even from simulations. Okay? You can do it if you know what's going on, for instance, if you know what the statistical mechanics is of your system. But we want to look at dynamical systems where we don't know the statistical mechanics. They're not in thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is meaningful for stationary process, but it essentially needs an infinite ensemble. Here's the Kolmogorov of complexity again the length of the shortest computer program um, that yields the sequence that you're after. Uh, this has a couple of problems, okay? First, shortest. How do you ever know that you have the shortest computer program that will generate that data set? Secondly, there isn't any general way if you take a string, which is like taking, let's say, a rational number, an irrational number, I should say, take an irrational number and find a way to code that in a finite length code, 
Okay? If you could do that, if you find a finite length code to describe an infinite sequence, okay, then the entropy in that sequence is zero. Right? The information you need to describe it is zero compared to the length of the sequence. So this has two problems. You can't, two problems, you can't, you don't have a general way of finding the algorithm, and even so, you can't show that it's shortest. Okay, so what you do instead is compression, is, um, is, is use data compression. And one of the coding methods that's used most often now is Lempel-Zeev coding, um, which has many uh, important characteristics. It's asymptotically uh, optimal, that means Asymptotically, it pro it's been shown mathematically that it approaches the Shannon entropy, um, and the time it takes to do it is order n, order the length of your system. It essentially takes one pass on the system. Um, I'll go quickly through this. So there are lots of different compression algorithms. The first one I ever learned as a Cub Scout was this one, which is Morse code. The way Morse code works is it looks at the alphabet. It looks at what is used. Actually, is there water around or something? OK. Um, it, it essentially looks at the usage of letters. And the most commonly used letters are E and T. And it gives them the shortest code, right? A dot for an E and a dash and the for the T. And for instance, the least used one is Z. So that's dash, dash, dot, dot. Nowadays, you can actually do a very good job doing a generalization of this. You look at your system, okay? You find the phrases, the words, or whatever that are most commonly used, and you just list them and the frequency that they're used, okay? And then you make a tree, and you give the most used, the shortest code, et cetera. This is called Huffman coding. And it almost does as well, well, not almost, but it comes... Uh, it, it, it can do something similar to what Lempel Zeev can do. Ah, this is something, I don't know how much I want to get into. This shows you how misogynistic uh, computer scientists and uh, engineers in general are, right? So, um, in the, thanks. Ah, it's even open. Okay. So they had to use something as, um, for instance, a picture or a data set in order for people to try and compress it. This is a Playboy Playmate of the Year. I'm not showing you the rest of it, okay? But that's what they chose to use for doing data compression, for seeing how good, do your, good your data compression program is. The I'm just the top? What? Just the top, right? They didn't use the whole picture. Although it turns out the picture, the entire picture is well known to computer scientists, <laughs> I found out. Anyway, um, this is an example of predictive coding. Another thing you do for coding is you just say, okay, I'm going to use the information I have before to predict what's next. If you do the simplest thing you can do just to show what you can get from this, um, if you simply say the next pixel is the same as the previous pixel, instead of using 256 um, different numbers, okay, um, the number you have to add to get from what you had on one pixel to the next lies in a very small range. So even if you just predict, if you just say the previous pixel, the next pixel is the same as the previous pixel, you compress a lot. Okay, these are the guys that Lempel and Zeev, who are, happen to be at the Technion, which is where Dove is, um, came up with a scheme which is... Uh, which is very heavily used nowadays. It goes like the following. It's called dictionary coding. What you do is you take your string that you want to compress, you put your cursor here, let's say. Your cursor is in this region because you previously coded up to here. You have a dictionary, which is what you coded before, and a look-ahead buffer, which comes after. What you're going to do is you're going to write down a triple, um, which involves the position of the longest match Okay, before the cursor, with what comes after, okay, how much you go back to where you found the position of the longest match, you 
tell how much to copy, with the length of it to copy, and you put down what the next character is. And the best way of showing, <coughs> doing this is to just show you an example. So this is a string here. In this case, the buffer size is four. That's the look-ahead region. The dictionary size is six. That's behind the cursor. You start out, you give it a zero, a, a dash to say you are starting out, a zero because there's nothing to copy at the beginning, and then the next letter, which is A. And you move your cursor over. Now you look ahead, you have this. You see an A there. You say, go back one, copy one, and you put a C. One, one, C. Over here, okay, you look back at your dictionary. It's AAC. Here you have AACA. And here's where you start seeing the advantage of this. What you say is, go back three, copy four. And that means cyclic. So it's AACA. Okay? And that's exactly what this is. So you put down three, copy four, and the next one is B. Okay? Now, why is this something that's interesting or powerful? Imagine it was A, from here on, it was AAC, AAC, AAC forever, right? Well, not forever, let's say for a million, okay? What you would write down is go back three, copy three million. The difference between a string that's three million long and writing copy three million is log of three million. The number of bits you need to write three million is log of that. So you can save like log n over n by doing things like this. And then we go on. That's essentially what Lempel's Eve coding is. Okay, it's used all over the place. I should have pointed this out to you. Actually, it's because I'm holding this thing. It's used in deflate and zip, all these things like that. What I, want, what I forgot to show you before I lose this guy okay, is the following. I want to show you how complicated it is to do this, okay? So what you do is, you go over here on your computer, you find a data file, you right-click it, and over here it says compress. Got it? Okay. So what I'm telling you is, if you want to know whether something is more ordered than something else, you know, and they're comparable sizes to start, or you can normalize by the length, you go over and you press that key and you compare the two files, okay? Um, okay, you should remember that. It's useful. <laughs> okay. Um, here we go. On. Let me take this. Okay. Um, this stuff is important. People have looked at it. It turns out that a lot of work was done on Lempel's Eve by uh, computer scientists, information theorists. Um, you can find the redundancy, which is the difference between what Lempel's Eve gives you and what the Shannon entropy is. Okay? If the um, Shannon entropy is zero, like for an ordered array, something yeah, that you can write down, um, something with no entropy, like a periodic sequence. Okay? The difference goes, the, you, you converge to it like log n over n. If the entropy is not zero, you can forge much more slowly, but in a well-defined way, log log n over n. It turns out the redundancy, the difference, is actually proportional to the entropy, which means you can solve this to find out at any n, if you know what your n is and you have a reasonable, a reasonable n, you can find out what the actual Shannon entropy is for such a system. Here's the way this works. If I take a random number, it doesn't compress. So as a function of the size of the system, the CID, the compression, doesn't compress you, essentially. You just get something that's flat. If you have something that's periodic, it dies like log L over L. If you have something that's quasi-periodic, like a Fibonacci sequence, it goes like log squared. There are all sorts of weird things in this, okay, and that also show you lots of differences between, for instance, the Kolmogorov complexity and the Shannon entropy. One of the primary things is pi. Now, many of you may know this, okay? Pi is indistinguishable from either any compression algorithm that anybody has ever made or from the Shannon entropy, and this has been looked at, you know, a lot, from a random number. Pi is a random number. Its Kolmogorov complexity is zero because you can write a short computer code, 
okay? They can give you pi to as many decimal places as you want. Essentially, this is a real problem. People have looked at it. It means in pi, if you wrote it out in binary, is all of Shakespeare, right? Okay. There are other things that are really interesting here. The Rudin Shapiro sequence over here, which is going towards zero entropy, that is, for a very long string, its entropy is very low, okay, has no two point correlation functions. So if you were to look, for instance, at this Fourier transform, if you look at, at, at um, spectral function, what you would find is that it looks flat, just like a random sequence, but there's no entropy in it. And if I get to it, I'll show you how you can actually use that. Uh, how good does this do, you might ask? So here, for instance, is entropy of mixing. That's essentially the first curve I showed you for the conserved lattice chaos. Here's what you find from Lempel's Eve. Here's what happens if you do an extrapolation, as I told you you can do. This is just inverting the equation for redundancy that I showed you uh, and solving for the Shannon entropy. You know, it's not exact, but it doesn't do too bad. Here's... Uh, what any physicist would look at first, the two-dimensional icing model, okay? If you use the same number A here as you did for the other, you're off. So you can't, A is not just a fixed number here for the extrapolation. But if you just take the, you, you take the compression and you fix the point at infinity whose, whose uh, entropy you know very well, okay? This is what you get. And again, it's pretty good and it gives you the critical point pretty well but it's not exact, okay? Um, it depends, so it depends what you mean. If you, for instance, if you take um, the, the logistic map, you can get the critical exponents and everything like that from doing this, okay? You can compress it, okay? And the compression depends where you are and whether it's chaotic and how chaotic and stuff like that. You can get the, uh, the Lyapunov exponents stuff. That's one of the first things we were thinking of doing, but then we found that it had been done. <laughs> okay. What about the, the to the what? How does the compression? Um, well, uh, I, th I, I, don't know what, I don't know what happens in that particular case. I don't know. But I've shown you that they don't necessarily match, because here the the entropy that you get from either Shannon or from compression is completely different from what you get from Kolmogorov. Pi has no entropy in Kolmogorov, okay, and it has, uh, okay. Anyway, I can, I can try answering that later. Wait a second, am I going the right way? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's not, th th it, these are pretty good, but they're not exact, okay? Of course, the bigger the system you make, the closer you get. Um, here's Lena again. Uh, that's up there because that's a two-dimensional image. So far, I've talked about one dimension. The question is how you make your string to compress. And the answer is, well, you can do a raster scan like that. You can do a rain scan like that. The best one you can do is a Hilbert scan. A Hilbert scan is a self-similar scan, you know, where you take a system like that and you essentially decimate or inflate it depending on how you want to look at it until you cover the picture, okay? All the pixels in the picture. And this one has a sense of locality that if you're local along the line, you're local in the space you're looking at, unlike a raster scan. Your camera tends to use a raster scan because there's a, a horizon and things are correlated relative to the horizon. Um, how much, time, how much time have I used, actually? Oh, I can see back there. Great, okay. Um, now I'm going to do some physics, okay? How, have, has everybody seen this movie? Has anybody seen this movie? This is, this is the movie by G.I. Taylor uh, showing you that low Reynolds number flow is reversible. I don't see lots of people... Has anybody else? No. So has everybody seen it? No. I'll show it. Anyway, okay, the only, the only reason I say this is for sure, and I always say this, and it's always true, um, if you've never seen this movie before, it's the only thing you remember about the lecture, 
okay? <laughs> so what this is is two concentric cylinders with a viscous fluid between them. What G.I. Taylor, who's an amazing scientist, uh, does is he puts red ink in there, and now he's twisting it around, so he's shearing the, the fluid inside here, right? And Lorentz number flow is reversible in a very specific sense, not like the laws of physics, where the laws of physics the same looking are the same going forward or backward in time. But here it uh, essentially amounts to the displacement of fluid elements being slave to the stresses you apply, which here are all applied by at the boundary. And he rotated it one way, and now he's rotating it back. And look at that. I've got to say, that's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, this is a great demonstration. Um, the question is, what happens if you put particles inside? So it turns out it's known for two particles at low Reynolds number. If you just take them uh, and you shear them past one another, they do a dance around one another like that, and they even end up on the same streamlines, and nothing happens, and it's completely reversible. And you would think in low Reynolds number flow, you'd always get reversibility, and it would always work, and everything should be laminar, and everything like that. But it turns out there's an experiment we did sometime in the 90s, okay, where we just looked at sedimenting particles at low Reynolds number, and if you just look at them, they look like they're just flowing down. If you do time lapse, you find that it's chaotic. Okay? In the same year as we did that, uh, it turns out that this group showed that if you even take three particles, um, they're chaotic. Essentially what happens, if you have two particles, one of them f falls in the flow field of the other, and they both fall faster than a single particle. If you put three of them, they do some, some sort of dance, and then two of them go off and leave one of them behind. And which one is left behind of this yellow, blue, and red ones ex depends exponentially on the positions. Okay? Um, so it's known that it's chaotic. Okay? That doesn't mean it's not reversible, necessarily. Dave Pine, who is my colleague, at NYU, did a beautiful experiment. He did G.I. Taylor's experiment with particles in it. So it's two concentric cylinders with a viscous fluid between them. Um, and what he's just going to do is rotate back and forth and see whether the particles come back to the same place. Um, he uh, density match the particles so they wouldn't sediment. He index match so you could see through it. And what they look like, if you look from the side with a camera, and here you're only seeing 1% of the particles. The others are index matched with the fluid, so you see right through them. The particles don't appear. 1% of the tracers to watch what the flow looks like. And this is them going back and forth as you shear it one way and then the other. Okay? And you can't tell from this whether they're reversible or not. Okay? If you want to tell whether it's reversible, you want to strobe it, so you take a picture only at the same time each cycle, right? And what that looks like is this, and this is actually a movie. You can see they're moving a little bit. You can see stuff behind, which is junk falling behind the apparatus, okay? But they're not moving much, so it looks like it's reversible. So it looks like that answers this, the question, okay? This is at a strain of one. The strain of one means you displace this surface relative to that surface by essentially the separation between them. That tells you that's like this amount, right? They're going like that, okay? Then they made the mistake of trying at a higher strain, like that, okay? And when they did that, looks like this, okay? Clearly not reversible, right? This is strobed, okay? Okay. Um, this, of course, this critical strain that you have to apply to get, it to get it not reversible depends on the volume fraction. Here's sort of a phase diagram for it. But what's really interesting is, until you get at a fixed volume fraction up to a certain strain, it's really reversible. And above that, it looks essentially chaotic or diffusive. Okay? So this is really an interesting discovery. Okay? So what's the explanation for it? So the explanation that they had was the following. They said, well, 
we know that two particles are reversible and three particles are not are chaotic. So it's probably the more you strain it, the more you get three particle interactions. If you only strain it a little bit, you get two particle interactions, etc. So I didn't like this. Okay. <laughs> I didn't like this explanation at all because I thought I knew something about random systems, having packed M&Ms. And um, one of the things I knew is if you have a random system that, you know, sometimes you have two particles together. It's less probable, but you certainly have three particles that are close together or four, as many as you want. So it can't be an explanation for something which has a transition, which has a real threshold. It can give you a crossover, but it can't give you a threshold. So I didn't understand what was going on, and I argued with them about it and stuff like that. And I told them, this can't possibly be the right explanation. And the guys that did this, Pine and Jerry Golub, are very smart guys. So I said, well, either I'm wrong, or I'm just not explaining it well enough. So I said, OK, I'll tell you what, I'll do a demonstration. I'll write a computer program, which for me is really unusual. I'll do a model and a simulation. And since I don't know how to do this, it's going to be the simplest simulation you could imagine, okay? So you put the particles in randomly, okay, in this simulation, and now you do an affine deformation to represent the strain you're putting on. Now, there's real hydrodynamics involved with this because they set up flows and everything, and I don't know the hydrodynamics well enough to do that. Uh, so what I said is I'll just do an affine deformation, take them straight across. If when I take them across they overlap, I'll say, well, they touched, I don't know what the hell is going to happen if they touch. All I know is they're going to move. So I'll say when I bring it back to the initial position, if they touch when I would, during the cycle, I'll bring them back to the initial position and I'll give them a little displacement. Okay? And that will represent that something's going on. And mainly what this was to show is that even if I strain a little bit, everything's going to move. Right? Okay. So um, I did the simulation. And it looks like this. So this, again, is strobe. So you're only seeing the particles after they come back. This is a strain below critical. This is a strain above critical. That's what I discovered later. Okay. Um, these guys are active particles. They're moving. Uh, it looks like some of these never move, but they get infected by the other ones, as you see. And as this goes on, what you see is that the activity here is slowing down. Okay. In fact, it stops. And this goes on forever. Okay. Now, I did these one at a time when I was doing it. And some, since I'm an experimentalist, the first thing I did is I hit my computer on the side. And they didn't activate again. Okay. So then I ran the simulation again, and it did the same thing. And as soon as I saw it the second time, I said, I understand what's going on. I, in fact, I understand their experiment. What happened is these guys explored different configurations until they found a configuration when, when you shear them, they don't collide. So they organize themselves by their collisions, right? And above some you know, threshold for some reason, they can no longer do that. They can no longer find a way to organize like that. And um, what we did is we then went back, Dave and I and his postdoc, um, Lauren Corte. Actually, I thought I had this in French. Anyway, to emphasize that it was Corte. Anyway, and what you find is that um, the time it takes to organize below the threshold, it goes to zero. This is the activity, okay, or the number of collisions per cycle. Uh, it takes some time to do that. And the time it takes depends on how much strain you put on. And above the threshold, it also takes some time before it goes to steady state. And when you plot those two guys, you get this divergence at the critical point, which means this experiment shows you a second-order phase transition, not thermodynamic, but dynamic. Okay? Okay. We then went... Um, actually, I, that was the simulation. So then we went back and we did the experiment, and the experiment shows the same thing, to make a long story short. Okay? So this is a model that we call random organization. 
And it looks a lot like what I was telling you before, and like some other models I'll show you, but it turns out I didn't know about those models. None of us knew about those models before we came up with this one, which is a continuum ra model rather than a lattice model. If you now do CID with this, and CID, the idea of using information to look at this, is already 10 years after the experiments and after that model came out, I think. You can see in that model there's a cusp which are in, in CID versus, in this case, volume fraction rather than shear, since you can go either way. Uh, you again can watch the evolution and get the critical exponents for the critical slowing down. You see again that where the position of the um, transition agrees with where the, the threshold is from the activity. But moreover, you can see, you can compare, okay, what the states would be for all absorbing states, that is, for states where particles don't overlap when you shear them, okay? And that's the red guys here, and the dynamics gives you something less than that, which means you're more ordered. You can also ask whether the system's ergodic. And you might say, ah, I might expect it to be ergodic. It's clearly not ergodic over here, because there are absorbing states that the system can never find by these dynamics, and you never sample those, okay? There are, I'm just telling you. I could prove that to you with a one-dimensional model, but in any event. But above, you see, you approach the states that are just the random states in the system, okay? The ones that you find by Monte Carlo. So eventually it goes ergodic, which is sort of what we expected, but we didn't know, yes? Here, I'm just coding the images. I'm just doing, in this case, a Hilbert scan. Yeah, I explained the Hilbert scan. A Hilbert scan of the image. Yeah. So it's just the image itself. So that'll first capture the pattern in the first image, which mostly then gets repeated if it's parallel. But we're not, com we're not doing it with time. So there's no time in here except the evolution of those images. Yeah. Right. It's, m it's interesting as well, since you know you can compress a movie, to do that. We haven't yet started on that. That's another dimension which will give more information about the system. There are other systems that do this. So I think I, what I try to show you is you can actually learn something from this that you didn't know. You can ask questions about whether you see all the states, whether the systems are ergodic, things like that. Um, you can discover new things that you didn't know before. Here's another model, which is very similar to actually the random organization model. If, two, if more than two particles on our site, you're active, you empty to neighboring sites, right? And the dynamics goes until you have no, not more than one particle per site. The dynamics is essentially shown here, uh, which I think is the first time that I showed you the real dynamics of these kind of systems. No, it looks very much like the random organization model, which is a continuum model. So you can do continuum as well. You have to worry about how you discretize space, right? But here is another one which has an absorbing state like that. Here's what it looks like. Again, the absorbing states are more ordered in some aspect that we don't yet know relative to all the absorbing states you can find. And you expect this guy to be ergodic when it goes up. And when we did this, we didn't see that. Here are all the states. Here's what you find in the active states over here. And it doesn't look like it's approaching that in any sort of reasonable way. So that bothered me. So again, when you see something after you do the CAD, you go back and you look what's actually going on. Um, here is what's actually going on. It's actually forming a dynamic checkerboard, okay? Because it turns out what Stefano did when he did this simulation is he did parallel updates. And when you do parallel updates, when you empty a site, you empty a site. So you have an empty site there. And this thing evolves by itself to give you this alternating checkerboard pattern, which nobody had ever seen before. If you now go back, okay, and instead of doing parallel updates, you do random updates, it goes to be towards something that's ergodic. Um, okay. Again, you can do the same thing as we were doing before and get the critical exponents for the, uh, for the critical slowing down. We're not just going to do absorbing state systems. That wouldn't be that interesting. We can do swimmers. 
One of the things we do is active matter. Here's this active matter system. This is a plastic particle made by Stefano Sakana, who's a professor of chemistry at NYU. He sticks a hematite particle over here. Hematite is a photocatalyst. When you shine blue light on it, it catalyzes the degradation of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. You get an oxygen gradient in solution. The oxygen gradient causes what's called diffusiophoresis of the particles. Particles in a concentration gradient of a chemical will swim one way or another, depending on whether the surface rejects or likes that chemical, okay? It'll sw swim toward a chemical it likes. So you have light-activated particles. You have active particles. Here they are, you turn on the light, they swim around. What's cool here, this was a study to show you something like what you'd imagine might happen for flocking or schools of fish or whatever, if you wanted to know whether it was physics or biology or chemistry that was causing that. Here, it's mathematics that's causing it. It's essentially, when you have the swimmers, when they come in, ah, by the way, this shows you that when you turn off the light, there's no potential interaction between the particles, right? They just come apart. You turn on the light, they crystallize again. And the physics behind this, or the math behind it, is very simple. It's simply, when they touch one another, they slow down. So now, the flux that you've got from the velocity of those guys going out is less than the, than the flux coming in. If you have the flux going out less than the flux going in, it builds up. It's unstable. It's like a negative diffusion constant. Um, okay, we want to look at this. Well, um, Melissa, who's a graduate student in the group, is looking at these guys now. She hasn't finished the study, but you, you can see as a function of time, the CID, the compression goes down when you turn the light off, and they disassemble, it goes back up. In the meantime, while we're waiting for those experiments, we looked at a model by Christina Marchetti, who is interested in these active Brownian particles, as they're called. So these are swimmers, okay? Um, there's a model of swimmers, a simulation, okay? We're going to do the same thing with this. We're just going to compress the images as a function of time. We're not compressing the time, we're just compressing the image and we're showing them as a function of time. So here is the initial configuration that we start with. It looks like that, okay? Then we let it go for, let's say, 10 to the 6 ste swimming steps, cycles, and we get these curves. Now, if we're over here, okay, what you find is the CID, the information density, is constant with time. The system is changing configuration all over the place, but the information doesn't change. You make a higher concentration like over here, and you watch it, and it goes along, and then it dives. And here what you find is after 10 to the 6 steps, you get a curve which is identical to the original one to here, and then it drops, and it follows that line. And if this were really entropy, okay, this discontinuity indicates a first-order phase transition. Yes? So what do you find? This is the, the volume fraction, sorry, the density. So this is how much of space is filled with the, uh, the spheres. Or in, ca in this case, this is, this is 2D, I think. So it's the area fraction covered by the particles, okay? So here you're just increasing the density. So here you can see that there's a first order phase transition. And now you go back and you look at what happened, and not surprisingly, over here it looks like that, and over here it looks like that. Okay, so you can see what happens, but it turns out seeing that it was first order is something that people tried using different order parameters, trying to find the correct order parameter for this, and they couldn't really distinguish whether it's first or second order, but this shows it immediately. Ah, now, what more can we do with this? And now we're looking for more things we can do. What about correlation lengths? Usually you get the correlation length by doing order parameter, order parameter, correlation function, seeing how it falls down. Maybe you don't have to do it that way. So the idea we had was this, and this is just shown, for example, for an icing model. Here's essentially a one-dimensional icing model. Here's your spin configuration. There are correlations in there. What you do is you decimate it. You only take every other spin, okay? Or every third spin or every fourth spin. Now, the basic idea here is if there's a correlation length in the problem, okay, what I'm going to do, by the way, is I'm just going to take this string and compress it. 
and see how much it can press compared to the length of the original string. The same with this string, the same with that string, okay? That's what the CID is, it's a ratio, okay? So what you expect is that if your correlation length is bigger than the spacing between the spins you're looking at, you'll find correlations and the information or entropy will be low. And once you decimate above a correlation length, the system will look random. So it will look just like a random system. And now you can do many things with this. One is you can simply say, as it approaches one, okay, which means incompressible because it's random, you can pick an arbitrary number here and say, that's the correlation length. If you simply do that with an icing model, a two-dimensional icing model, this is what you get, and you get the right critical exponent for the correlation length, okay? Um, okay. You can do better than that. You can do some real stuff. That is, you can take, you can, you can follow somebody that actually knows what he's doing, like Leo Kadanoff, okay? Leo Kadanoff says, well, like do real space renormalization. What you do is you divide the system into chunks and you use a majority rule to say if there are more spins up here than spins down, I'm going to label this a spin up, right? And this one will be a spin down, et cetera, okay? And now I just keep on doing that as a function of this scale parameter, right? And now I compress that, and what I find is this set of curves, okay? This is for um, the conserved lattice gas for different densities, okay? That's the first model I showed you. And you get this series of curves, and then you see whether they scale, and you scale them with rho c minus rho to the nu, and they all fall one another. It all collapses, right? And this critical exponent here is the critical exponent, okay, that's known for that. You could have fit the critical exponent and got the critical exponent from this. You can do um, 2D icing as a function of temperature. Here's what you get by, this des by the scaling procedure, if you like, the real space procedure, and here's how it collapses. Right, all to the same curve, which says essentially everything here is just a function of delta over the correlation length, the compression thing. Here's another model. This is one of Dove's favorite models because his name is on it, okay? And it's a jamming model, a traffic jamming model, okay? Well, the rule is red guys can only go to the right from where you're looking, and blue particles can only go down, and they can block one another. So that guy can't move while that guy is there, right? And it's actually a fairly beautiful model. It shows you self-organization in a really weird way. This is the dynamics of it, right? And this is in the jam state, and so this thing is going to go to completely jammed, okay? Like, come on, come on, come on like that, okay? Now you look at this, okay? And it's known that this is a transition from where everything is flowing to where they're jammed. That was known before. It's also known that's first order. Here's what you get from the CID, okay? And what you can see is a jump here. You can actually see that there's coexistence in some regions, okay? And here's what wasn't known before. There's another transition. People had hinted, there might, that had hinted there might be another transition before. But in the jam state, you can have a single cycle here or a different winding number. And there's actually a cascade of first-order transitions over here that was never seen before that you find from this. I mentioned Rudin Shapiro before. Rudin Shapiro is the sequence which is actually given just by essentially an inflation rule, by a matrix. A goes to B, A, B, B goes to A, C, et cetera. If you substitute in A, you can just write out what this is. An algorithm that gives you this entire sequence is a very short algorithm, okay? So its entropy is zero, and I showed you its entropy goes down with the size of the system. Um, but I also told you this guy has the property that its two-point correlation function is flat, okay? If you do S of Q or G of R, it's just flat at one, okay? So it looks to something like that, like a random sequence, but it's not random at all, okay? The interesting thing is, 
if you multiply by any sa- anything with this, so if you multiply any sequence by a random sequence, you get a random sequence, right? The interesting thing is, if you multiply anything by Rudin Shapiro, you don't get something random, but you get something whose spectral, spectral function, whose S of Q or G of R, is just flat. See, so here's showing it to you. Here it turns out is S of Q, the structure factor, um, density density correlation function for a transform, essentially. Um, for an icing model, which has strong correlations in it depending on the temperature. This is the temperature over here. So the lower you go, the stronger the correlations are. You take this and you multiply it by something that's random, and S of Q, that's this red line over here, it gives you something that's flat like that. Okay? Like that. Okay? You multiply it by Rudin Shapiro, and you get something which is the orange line, which is even flatter, okay? But now you compress it after you multiply by random. If you compress it after you multiply by random, it's flat and random. This is a function of temperature, which is off the screen over here. I mean, icing 2D, this is 1D icing, actually. So 1D icing by itself looks like that. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Looks like that. And you multiply by the root Shapiro, and you see the information is still there. It's changed, but it's still there. You can cloak with this. You multiply by Rudin Shapiro, and for two-point correlations, there's nothing there. If you want to get your information back, okay, you multiply by Rudin Shapiro again, and it's gone, right? Okay? And there are lots of different forms of Rudin Shapiro, I should say. Okay? You can take 1D icing over here. You can do the... Um, the decimation that I told you before to get the correlation length, the scaling, and it collapses to this. You take the Rudin Shapiro icing and you collapse it, it collapses to that, which isn't quite so good because it turns out um, this goes away, this collapses better and better the bigger the system you have. One of the icing has a correlation length which is exponential. Um, I'm done. Did I use up the time? <laughs> or do I have time left? Three minutes, oh my God. Uh, okay, so the main thing you should take away from this is without knowing anything about an order, the order of a system, what the order is, you can find out whether it's ordering, you can find out um, information about critical exponents, um, what else do I have? In, in, I've shown you equilibrium, non equilibrium, on lattice, off lattice systems. Um, what can we do next with it? We're going to do more with experiments. We want to look at stuff that the people in the glass community who were here two weeks ago giving a really nice symposium had to see whether you can find order in the glasses. We want to look at the universe, okay, because there's data on position of stars as a function of time to see whether there's any evolution in that, okay. Um, there should be, I've shown you just, quant- just classical examples of this. You ought to be able to do this for quantum systems as well, but I don't know how to yet. You can look at things like memory. You'd also look at the stock market. Um, and we haven't even started looking at what you can do with time, since you can compress with time as well. And that will give you things like glassy systems and other things like that. And um, I'll conclude with something with Stefano uh, to make things clear. With what Stefano found, I think, yesterday in some newspaper that he was reading, which is the Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov directions. Okay? That is, if you want to get home tonight, okay, instead of saying, okay, drive this way for this much, drive this way from this much, drive this way from this much, what you should do is, Take every left turn that doesn't put you on a prime numbered highway or street named for a president, and you'll get home. (laughs) And that's the Kalmogorov way of doing it. Okay, thanks. (laughs)